Welcome. In this brief video we'll be taking a look at some of the major schools of interpreting the phenomenon of revolutions in world history. For starters, understand that uh, revolutions have been studied in fields as diverse as history, political science, anthropology, psychology, and economics. And uh, the literature in the field of revolutionary studies can take years uh, to fully grasp. Throughout the course we will continue to develop our awareness of the various theories uh, regarding revolution uh, via the readings and via the course assignments. So don't be overly concerned um, that uh, you haven't mastered this extensive literature base through a 10 minute video. Um, instead try to take away a general sense of the various major perspectives on revolution and use the video simply as an introduction um, to literature we'll be drawing upon throughout the semester. As long as there have been revolutions, humans have attempted to understand why revolutions have occurred. In particular, though, over the past 150 years or so, scholars have developed a number of theories to attempt to explain the causes of revolution. Some theories also attempt to provide a predictive model for calculating the likelihood that the revolution will occur at any given time. One of the earliest attempts to explain and predict revolutionary behavior was developed by Karl Marx with help from his collaborator Friedrich Engels. While scholars today are free to agree or disagree with the conclusions of Marx and Engels, these individuals, it's important to note, were among the first to develop scientific methods to explain revolutions. Marx argued that revolution is most likely to result when existing political and social structures impede economic changes. Marx examined the history of revolutions at key historical junctures, such as the transition from feudalism to capitalism. Conflict emerges, according to Marx, when there are groups that compete for access or compete for resources. Uh, while Marx's theory is uh, far more complex than I will cover in a short video lecture like this. Uh, he distilled revolution down to two famous statements. Uh, the first, that the existing social and political system is to be changed by a revolution. And secondly, that a social revolution is to be identified with an overthrow of that existing social system by violence. That being said, Marx did leave open the possibility that a peaceful revolution is possible via class struggle as opposed to armed violence. Uh, Marx did not fear the prospect of armed struggles for power and he certainly didn't reject um, armed struggle. However, he did not necessarily glorify violence nor did he claim that violence was the only possible path leading to victory. Certainly by the 1870s uh, Marx was writing that a peaceful transition to socialism was possible under the right conditions. Um, Vladimir Lenin um, reinterpreted Marxist theories by arguing for the role of what he called a revolutionary vanguard. According to Lenin, an educated working class revolutionary, the so-called vanguard of the socialist movement, would spread revolutionary ideas to the population and Lenin thus argued, contrary to the teachings of Marx, that revolutions could indeed emerge in peasant-based societies with the proper revolutionary vanguard to lead the peasants. A number of scholars in the first half of the 20th century attempted to explain revolutions in terms of predictable phases that all revolutions go through. These were largely attempts to construct models to explain and predict more than they were analytical theories. In particular, theorists such as uh, Crane Britton, who you see pictured here, and George Sawyer Petty uh, developed phase-based models to explain revolutions. Both scholars produced theories that roughly agreed on the following points. First, a segment of a country's intellectual elites turn against the government after some period of crisis. In the next phase, the old regime attempts some belated reforms that are ineffective and that fail to save the old order. The revolutionary coalition next begins to fall apart due to internal divisions. Uh, the next phase is the emergence of a relatively moderate post-revolutionary government. Uh, next, the failure of the moderates to satisfy popular expectations leads to the emergence of a more radical group of revolutionaries taking power. 
Um, these new radical revolutionaries then employ extreme measures to continue the revolution, alienating much of the population. And in the final phase, pragmatic moderates um, replace the radicals and turn back some of the excesses of the radical phase. Advocates of the frustration aggression theory argue that revolution is most likely to occur when a lengthy period of rising expectations and rising gratifications is followed by a period of sharp reversal. And when the gap between expectations and gratifications quickly widens and becomes intolerable, revolution is likely to occur. Frustration then becomes focused on the government and the violence becomes more rational and directed at the common target, in this case the government. If the frustration is sufficiently widespread, intense, and directly focused on the government, so the theory goes, uh, the violence evolves into revolution. It should be noted that low levels of poverty or economic deprivation do not automatically lead to rebellion and violence. The people who are among uh, the most impoverished are generally unavailable and unprepared for revolutionary activities as they are engaged in a daily struggle simply to stay alive. They lack you know, both the energy and the resources to organize, organize political movements on their own. However, when expectations change and relative deprivation emerges, revolution is more likely to occur. Uh, the French philosopher Alexis de Tocqueville uh, described this phenomenon, even though he didn't refer to it as frustration aggression theory, in relation to the French Revolution. He wrote that the, the evils which were endured with patience so long, they were inevitable, seem intolerable as soon as a hope can be entertained of escaping them. The abuses which are removed seem to lay bare those which remain and to render the sense of them more acute. The evil has decreased, it is true, but the perception of evil is more keen. Feudalism in all its strength had not inspired as much aversion in the French as it did on the eve of its disappearance. A theory of revolution known as systems theory emerged during the late 1950s that attempted to expand the range of factors that contribute to revolutions. Unlike uh, Marxist theory of revolution, systems theory does not analyze revolutions in terms of technological change and economic shifts. Proponents of systems theory, such as uh, Neil Smelzer and Chalmers Johnson, argued that uh, revolution is most likely to occur when governments fail to perform essential functions. Smelzer, in particular, identified six criteria that produce conditions in which revolutions are more likely to occur. In the first, he argued that what he called structural conduciveness must be present. This would be the existence of significant social division in a society, such as racial or ethnic strife. Smelzer next argued that social strains must be evident, which would be visible signs that the social order is in danger. Smelzer's third criteria is what he referred to as the growth of a generalized belief system, which is the appearance of a, a revolutionary ideology that grows out of the social strains. Uh, his fourth criteria he identified as precipitating factors, which would be uh, events that seem to confirm the calls for revolution. The fifth criteria Smelzer identified was the mobilization of participants for revolutionary action, which might result from panic, uh, general hostility, or a more rational and organized effort to lead a revolution. The final criteria Smelzer identified was the presence of what he called counter-determinants, and these would usually be in the form of police or military action um, to attempt to repress the emerging insurgency. Similar to Marxist theoreticians on one level, proponents of modernization theory associate revolution with economic and technological changes. However, unlike Marxist theory, modernization theory does not specify a particular arrangement of stages in which change occurs, nor do modernization theorists particularly identify with um, individual groups that will or should emerge victorious in a period of conflict. Instead, proponents of modernization theory, such as uh, Seymour Martin Lipset pictured here, argued that uh, technological and economic changes tend to mobilize groups that formerly were not politically active or participatory um, by raising their expectations. The failure of the state to meet these raised expectations, according to modernization theorists, is the catalyst to revolution. 
Proponents of structural theory, which began to emerge in the late 1960s, agree on one level with Marxists that revolution is most likely to occur when there are significant shifts in social structures. Uh, however, structural theorists differ from Marxists in the sense that they do not necessarily view any particular group as, as a determined victor in a conflict. They leave also open the possibility that there can be structural shifts that cannot be foreseen or predicted. One proponent of structural theory, Barrington Moore Jr., argued that peasant rebellions were most likely to occur when a traditional agricultural society was transitioning to a capitalist-oriented agricultural system. Similarly, uh, Eric Wolf argued that peasant societies were more likely to enter periods of revolution when the commercialization of agriculture threatened the access of peasants to land in order to farm. One of the most influential and comprehensive theories of revolution was developed in the late 1970s by sociologists Theta Squatchpole and Ellen K. Trimberger. Squatchpole and Trimberger draw from several disciplines, and roughly their work falls into the category of structural theory, but their theory expanded both the scope of the study of revolutions as well as the factors that can lead to revolution. Squatchpole and Trimberger agree with Marx that revolution is not simply due to some inherent uh, cultural component of a given society, but they disagree with Marx in the sense that they argue that revolution needs to be viewed from the context of the larger world environment as opposed to simply internal factors. Revolution, argue Squatchpole and Trimberger, is most likely to occur in heavily agrarian states that are relatively behind the rest of a region in terms of technological development and they would argue that the revolution is most likely to occur in such states that also find themselves confronted with external pressures from nations with a greater state of technological advancement. Moreover, Scotchpol and Trimberger argue that the reasons for revolution are primarily political as opposed to the economic focus of Marx and Engels. Now, this draws to a close our very brief look at some of the major schools of a theory of revolution